Well, uh, as a, a good morning as a, again. Um, I've got quite a lot to get through, so I, I'll better plunge straight in. Um, I must say that I always find that there's a sort of tragic air about looking at South Africa's record in recent time, and part of the tragedy is that South Africans on the whole have been so poorly prepared for the experience they've been through. And this is because they basically the sort of naivety which comes from living on the southern tip of Africa and not knowing much about the rest of Africa, and in addition, not knowing much about what has happened to revolutionary nationalist movements elsewhere in the third world, often not knowing much about South African history. Uh, and I find that as a result, you know, we had this long period of rainbow nation, Mandela magic, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and it was very difficult then to sort of get anyone to understand that, you know, what was happening and what was coming down the line. I remember in the late 90s uh, meeting up with Tony Leon, and they d the ANC just brought out its um, document on CADA deployment. And I said to Tony, this is the most terrible thing. This will ruin the state. And he agreed. And we both then made a fuss about it, me in the pages of the Helen Sussman Foundation publications, he on the, and we were told to shut up and we were reactionaries and what were we talking about and this was all nonsense and how could you rock the boat and, you know, it was just like that, that for a long time. But as we know, that naivety has now gone and uh, we find that even today, that although it's not completely gone in all quarters, that we do find that many uh, black people, African journalists and others, are quite outspoken in the way that they look at things. Now let me quote Barney M. Tomboti, for example, who I think is a good man. He says, in hindsight, handing the country over to the ANC has been a bit like throwing pearls before swine. Never in our wildest dreams could we have foreseen the destruction it was about to wreak. Or, to take another black voice, and Paul Palazzi, who is the mayor of Johannesburg, saying, there are a lot of problems in Joburg. Our city is in ruins. It's painful for me to say that, but it's the truth. The city of Joburg is in ruins. And, well, one could go on. But, uh... When I wrote about how long will South Africa survive uh, some years ago, I was actually looking mainly at the problem of indebtedness and the possibility that South Africa would end up having to go to the IMF to be bailed out uh, with all that that means in terms of conditionalities and so on. Now, since then, we had two very big lucky breaks. One, of course, was the minerals boom, which has put off <coughs> such dire uh, possibilities for a while. And the other was the re-evaluation of GNP, which showed that the economy was actually 11% bigger than we'd thought, uh, both of which had the effect of lowering the uh, level of indebtedness as a proportion of GDP. Now, that has not gone away by any means. Uh, I think by the end of this year, we're going to owe something like 75% of GDP. And, of course, with rising interest rates across the world, the burden of interest payments on that is getting bigger all the time. But there are many other crises. Uh, unemployment, inequality, poverty, the electricity crisis, water, sewage, uh, public hospitals, and so on and so forth. In fact, I, I sometimes feel it's a bit like, um, I don't know whether you ever saw the film The Wild One. I think it was the first film about juvenile delinquency in the 50s with the young Marlon Brando, and in it he's a sort of tearaway motorcyclist wearing a leather jacket and so on. And at one point, some outraged middle-aged citizen says to him, what exactly are you protesting about? And he says, what you got? <laughs> it's a bit like that. If you want a crisis, we can fit you out with one. Now, I think that if you look at the situation today, I would say that to characterize it, we need to look at it a bit differently than we have. We know that we've been limping along with very low growth for a long time. But I think that we have to face up now to the fact that what we are facing is nothing less than regression. 
that we are in many respects going backwards. And this is a very new and startling fact, and it's something that doesn't actually happen often in history, and we know it's a, it's a rather alarming thing. One remembers you know, all the talk about the Dark Ages and so on. But let me just run through with you some of the key indicators. Real GDP per capita has been shrinking since 2014, it's eight years now. By 2020, on average, South Africans were 10% poorer than they'd been in 2014. 18.3 uh, million people now live below the poverty line, which is nearly one-third of the population. Malnutrition is common. As people get poorer uh, and unemployment gets higher, people get more and more desperate, and we get an increasingly feral society. And we see the results in crime, vandalism, looting, and so forth. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very difficult to talk about that. Well, I, let me not go on. Uh, let, me, let me pass over that for the moment. Of course, power cuts, we know all about that. Um, but the key thing to remember is that electricity arrived in Kimberley in 1882 and in Cape Town in 1895. In other words, this is a 19th century industry. Uh, I suppose 19th, 20th. Uh, back in 1960, we only generated 4,000 megawatts. But by 1990, that figure had risen to 40,000. Today, it's 45,000, but we're going to need another 50,000 in the next 13 years, which it seems most unlikely to me. We've got major problems over water and sewage. 63% of the country's sewage and water treatment works are in a critical or poor state. Uh, and, well, you need only need to go to Durban to see the problems of that, or indeed Port Elizabeth. Uh, both of them in different ways now suffering very bad problems with their water. The decay of rural roads, a very serious point. We're getting to the point where many of those roads will go back to being tracks, as they were in the 19th century. Um, again, this regression is quite clear. Farmers can do their best to repair things, but they can't really make up for the lack of proper road maintenance. Now, and the ports, of course, are not working as well even as they did in the 1960s. Recently, the World Bank did a survey of the world's ports, and Durban, Port Elizabeth, Cape Town, etc., they all came in the last two or three out of 350. Uh, I mean, the worst in the world, uh, frankly. Uh, computer terminals, out of 370 in the world, Durban came 364. I mean, you know, th these are just desperate figures. And it's worth thinking about this because we also, you can see the virtual disappearance of the post office and the failure of the railways. Now, again, if you go back and look at South African history and you look at any small town anywhere in the Karoo or wherever you like, you look at the history, it'll always be marked out with a great deal of emphasis. This was the year when the post office arrived. This was the year when the railway came through. That really made all the difference. Now, we're talking about 19th century industries, post office and railway. And again, these are now failing. And we're getting back to the point where we almost have to do without them. So you can see this pattern of regression now very clearly. We can even see that in education, 78% of grade four pupils can't read for meaning in any language, and perhaps worse, grade six pupils, 64% can't do that. That means we're not only failing to educate people, but literacy is declining. I mean, goodness, you know, what better index can you get? Even fine, if you take the use of bucket toilets, which the ANC was supposed to have got rid of long ago, last year their use actually increased, more people using them. So we can see this pattern of regression uh, in many, many areas now. Uh, I won't go on about the mining industry because I think you will all have read about that, but we now are currently on the Fraser figures. Uh, out of 84 countries rated become 75. Um, the Bureau of Economic Research in Stellenbosch measures the country's performance in 66 areas. 
if you look at their March 22 report, uh, which said still in nine, regressed in 33, and gained in 24. So we went backwards overall. And of course, more and more towns and cities are reaching the point of collapse. Uh, in May this year, the Treasury said that of the country's 257 municipalities, 170 were in financial distress, of which 43 were so bad that they'd been placed under administration. But this couldn't be done because, as the Director General of the Treasury said, the challenges are just too many. Later, he said that nearly 150 municipalities were either bankrupt or insolvent. And that's pretty amazing, really, to, to think of that. What it actually means is that local ANC elites have robbed and mismanaged most of the country's towns and cities into the ground, and the national ANC is effectively washing its hands of the problem. Already, in effect, 43 towns and cities have been written off, and up to two-thirds may soon be written off. Bloemfontein will almost certainly be, the Mangung, if you like, will be the first metro to go. By the, way, every, by the look of it. So if you put all these things together, I think the pattern of regression is very, very clear and it's very serious. And uh, this should color the way that we look at things. In a very real sense, we cannot go on. You know, that if you start going backwards, all sorts of things will go wrong and crises will multiply. And we're reaching a, a pretty clear turning point. Now, when you look at these things, you realize that people say, well, it could go on. We could just keep on going down and so forth. Um, there's no inevitable change coming. And indeed, that's one of the saddest things, really, because under apartheid, there was always hope. We all knew it couldn't last forever. We all knew that it was ridiculous and wrong. We all knew the rest of the world hated it. It was a matter of time before it went one way or the other. Demography was against it. So you always knew, you always had hope. More difficult now to have hope because you look at the ANC and you say, well, they could be in power forever and so forth. Now, I think this is wrong. And one should bear in mind the Soviet example because, of course, it seemed to people in the Soviet Union, too, that that was forever. And in fact, there's a rather nice book by a man called Alexei Yurchak, who wrote about this. And the title of his book is, Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More. Because that's what happened. Now, when you think, the Soviet example is quite an interesting one, really, because in the early 1960s, Nikita Khrushchev, then the leader, made a speech in which he said, the next generation will live under communism. We will make this transition from socialism to the com full communist society. The withering away of the state, all the things that we've talked about, it's only 20 years away. In the early 80s, it will happen. And this is very exciting for many people. Now, in fact, uh, Brezhnev shortly uh, thereafter took over and quickly said, that's not right, we're going to stay in a state of socialism. Nonetheless, Khrushchev's point stuck in people's minds. And by the early 80s, people looked around and said, well, what's happened? And the answer was shortages everywhere, queues everywhere, things not working, quite clearly, not at all what had been said. And this was very important because there began to be a loss of legitimacy. People stopped believing in the system. Uh, no accident that, that Gorbachev, who by the way died uh, this morning, um, but no accident, he came along very shortly thereafter. Because when a system fails that badly and publicly, at a certain point you get this loss of legitimacy. And I think that's exactly what is happening now to the ANC and to its rule. Uh, people are looking around and remembering that they've been promised, year after year, a better life for all. And here we are, 28 years later, and it quite clearly is not the case. And everybody knows this. There's simply no hiding it. And we've even got to the point when, when there's an emergency, like the floods in Natal, the 
the first question that comes up is, will any aid money get stolen? Uh, because nobody has any trust at all in the government. Corruption is so common. And you can see the effects of this in the way that the media talks about the government. I mean, gone is the exaggerated respect, the idea of the moral high ground and all that sort of thing. And indeed, um, I suppose, I, I don't wish to be unkind to him particularly, but Peter Bruce, to me, is I an mean, interesting journalist. I always read what he has to say. But he is a weather vane. And of course, he backed Ramaphosa uh, for the uh, election in 2017. But here he is this year writing, saying that Ramaphosa is slow, inattentive, poorly advised, and insincere. The absence of jobs, confidence, investment, infrastructure, tourists, and security is mostly his fault. His appointments are mostly appalling. His policy and strategic choices grotesque. Well, there you are. Hasn't taken Peter that long to do a 180 degree turn on that. Now, um, the key thing to, by the way, wh why is it that things have become so bad? After all, not all African countries have failed as badly as this. Kenya's not doing too badly. Ghana's all right. Maybe un under IMF control again, but it's actually a nice country and doing not badly, let alone the success stories like Mauritius and Botswana. I think there are two reasons, really. One is that elsewhere in Africa, African nationalist movements took over fairly simple economies, usually cash crop economies. The main question every year was getting the cash crop to the coast to export it. That's what the economy was about, and very small government and civil service. As we know, South Africa was a much more complex, developed, sophisticated economy and society. And I think that's important because it meant that the gap between the ability and skills of the new elite and what was actually required uh, to run such a society was much, much greater here than it had been in most African countries. But secondly, of course, South Africa was quite a lot richer than most other African countries. And in the minds of most African people, it was seen as fabulously rich. And the result, of course, was high excitement among the elite from the earliest days at the thought of the pickings that were available. And uh, the result has been a huge feeding frenzy. I mean, that's really what's been going on. Uh, all these years, and it's got more and more pronounced, of course. And I think the combination of those two things is very, very destructive. Now, the question is, why has the political system not really adjusted to this and reflected this? I think there are several reasons. Uh, my, my great friend Belinda Bazzoli, now unfortunately no longer with us, uh, was DAMP, and she said to me, you know, it's a strange situation in Parliament because almost every day you get reports from this, that, or the other body or committee or whatever about the disastrous situation with regard to X or Y or whatever. And it's just dreadful. And each time, you know, it's bad news. And you're going along and you talk to the minister or the deputy minister or the committee chairman and you say, look, you know, what are we going to do about this? It's an absolutely terrible situation and so on. And she said, you know, the funny thing is that they're not really very interested and their eyes sort of glaze over and difficult even to keep their attention. And then you look at them and you realize that actually they are better off than they've ever been before. They're earning a very nice salary in excess of a million rand a year, maybe several million. Uh, they've got big official cars. They've got any number of perks. They're living in heaven. It's very difficult to persuade them that things are not in a good way, because in terms of their own lives, it's unbelievably good. And you said, so there is this huge sort of class difference that the elite lives in this completely different world, and you're trying to bring them bad news, and they don't want to know about it. But I think the second reason is, of course, ethnic mobilization, that because the ANC has depended essentially on this ethnic mobilization of the vote, uh, 
that you then get a sort of blockage in the political system because Parliament is occupied by a large group which simply isn't going to listen, which is going to support whoever the president is, whether it's Zuma or Becky or whatever, and uh, is going to shut you up. And so the result is that you know, this does not get reflected properly at political level. Now, we've been here before. Um, if you think of it in the 70s and 80s, things were going badly wrong. But again, we had this ethnic mobilization of the Afrikaans community, which meant there was a strong national party, later conservative party, majority in parliament. And the result was, again, the sort of blockage that you couldn't get reflected there what was actually going on. Now, the result was, of course, that politics moved into the street. That while Parliament continued to debate things like whether you should have mixed sports, I mean, for heaven's sake, uh, in the townships, all hell was breaking loose in the street. And that became the real focus of attention in the country. It wasn't much debated in Parliament. But, you know, that was happening now. The same thing is happening now. I mean, we saw in the street in July 2021 the riots and so forth which tore through this province and also Gauteng. The Zamazamas, the Operation Dudula, the various mafias, the sort of construction mafia, the coal industry mafia, the taxi mafia, it's all going on in the street all sorts of thuggery and nonsense and so forth, because of the blockage of the political system. We're not even talking in Parliament about those things. Now, I think that, as I say, this happened before, and this, uh, the opposition was somewhat ineffectual in that situation. Uh, and so the question is, really, who can point the way ahead? Who can lead us out of this situation? And so on. Now, I think that's actually a very difficult uh, question. Uh, the opposition, as I say, is in a very weak position. Uh, they have to make their way in Parliament, and Parliament is blocked in the way that I described. I think more could be done, but it's difficult. Uh, if you look to the universities, which were very important under apartheid and giving a, a lead in the anti-apartheid way, it's quiescent, it's quiet. You don't hear many voices coming out of universities. Those that you do are usually very politically correct, very much on a sort of left-aligned uh, part of the, the rainbow. And uh, many people who don't hold those sort of views are actually scared to speak up because it's a not a friendly atmosphere for them on most campuses. I'm afraid that's just the situation we face. We also have so-called civil society. And again, not much is happening. We've still got quite a lot of NGOs which are really very far to the left, ANC or more so, Communist Party, I mean like the Institute for Economic Justice and so forth. The number of liberal NGOs is very few. You've got Race Relations, you've got the Helen Susan Foundation, Center for Development and Enterprise, that's about it. And most of them are struggling. So we don't get very much from them. What we do get a certain amount of is scenarios. And uh, this is one of my bête noire, really, because you often hear scenario planning t t talked about in the press as a form of research. And of course, it's exactly not that. Uh, you know, you, you get scenarios, particularly now, we get lots and lots of happy talk about 2024. And you'll get uh, people publishing things with a pie chart about various outcomes, saying there's a 50% chance that the ANC will keep its majority. There's a 5% chance that the DA will get 40% of the vote, and so on and so forth. Now, None of this is research. It's all wild blue yonder speculation. And nobody knows the result of an election two years away. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous, really, to call it research. And it, I'm afraid only very silly journalists do that. And in any case, the assumption is 
that political change will come as a result of parliamentary elections, which, of course, they might, but there are many other ways in which it can happen. And after the riots of 2021, we know that, surely. Uh, and there are many other things that could happen. Most of the crises that I mentioned en passant uh, could produce dramatic showdowns which are not dependent on parliamentary majorities. So what does that really leave us with? Well, business, in a sense the heroes of the story because the growth that we've had has been entirely due to the private sector. Public sector investment has fallen to almost nothing. Overall investment is only 13% of GDP. And uh, everything that works is pretty much private sector. And this is achieved despite the hostility of the government in many respects. I mean, the most dramatic to me is the current ban on allowing private hospitals to train nurses. Now, that is deliberately sabotaging the health system. We know that the whole health system needs more nurses, whether it's private or public to deliberately prevent the training of nurses is an amazing thing to do. It's done out of spite against the private medical system. But in fact, those nurses could be anywhere. So business often labor under great disadvantages. And there are no shortage of people saying, well, business must give a lead. Now, I don't really believe in that, because the same thing happened over and over again in the 1980s, where people said business must give a lead. And of course, in the end, it didn't happen. Um, there were many concerned businessmen, but at the end of the day, businessmen have to look first and foremost to their own business, make sure that's going to survive and so forth. Uh, they don't particularly want to annoy and provoke the government. And uh, it's just asking them to do things which are not part of their function, really. Uh, they would far rather contribute to a political party which does things like that for them. So I don't think it's realistic to expect the business community to do that sort of job for you. In which case, in a sense, we are flying blind. And uh, because there's no group that we can see actually leading the way. Now what we are told, and I think rightly, is that the ANC is decaying and gradually becoming a rural party, a Bantustan party, and so forth. But again, we've been here before. In the 1970s and 80s, we are all the time were told we have Verkrampters and Verlichters, and everything depends on that. And we have to just hope that the Verlichters are going to gradually gain strength and so on. In other words, we were told that whatever crises are going on in the country, we must all set our clocks by the balance of power within the uh, Afrikaner Nationalist Party which, of course, had no particular relationship to the crises actually wrecking the society. And the same thing is true now, that the slow and inevitable decline of the ANC is, is one sort of clock. But the crises we've got are quite immediate, and we, we can't really set our clock by the slow decline of the ANC. Uh, and uh, we, we've got to think in terms of, you know, how, how do we sort of move out of that and I think that if we, we look at that, really, uh, we realize that if you go back to the 1980s, that P.W. Boerta was holding on as far as he could. He wasn't really able to chart a, a way forward, not after the tricameral parliament. And so, you know, he held the ring, and he just tried to sort of prevent the sort of change he didn't want, but he didn't really have any perspective of change. Now, in 1990, when he finally had to step down, he was 74, and not unreasonably, he was at the end of a long career. He'd been in Parliament for over 30 years, been a minister for more than 25. And, you know, he didn't have a long-time perspective ahead of him. So you could hardly expect him to be taking that sort of longer view. Whereas uh, de Klerk was a man, in his, he was 53 at that time. Had politics been in a different situation, he could have looked ahead to maybe 20 years as president. So he had a completely different attitude. And his first response was to say, 
we can't go on like this. That was where he began from. And everything flowed from that. Since we can't go on, what are we going to do? And we know how he, what, what answer he came up with. Now, I think it's fairly clear that uh, Cyril Ramaphosa has, in effect, been a PW in this situation. By the way, he's 70 in a month or two times, so I mean, he's not a young man either. But I think the key point is he's got no particular perspective for the future. He's hanging on. He's trying to sort of put plasters on things. Uh, he's got no particular solution to anything. And it's, it's much the same sort of holding operation uh, uh, that we've seen before, really. And uh, that's really where we are at the moment. Now, I think that if we, um, if we look at this, what we realize is that, oh, by the way, of course, the ANC in this situation, I mean, it's quite remarkable. What it's doing is coming up with, uh, you know, as we know, the, the basic income grant is, is the question of the day. I saw in yesterday's business day, there was a, a, an article saying that, in effect, the, the decision has been taken that there will be a basic income grant. And the decision has also been taken that in the year following that, in the year following, the government must come up with, that was the phrase used, um, some sort of way of identifying how the funding for this shall be provided. Pretty amazing stuff, right? Eh? Spend the money first and then work out how you're going to find it, which is actually how we came in. I mean, if you look back at the RDP, that was unbudgeted, uncosted, just unplanned public expenditure. You know, crazy, really. And we don't seem to have advanced. Now, not only do we have the BIG, we've got plans for the NHI, which will cost at least 500 billion a year, state bank, state pharmaceutical company. Uh, and so on. All of these things, of course, completely unrealistic. I mean, we know that the economy can't possibly support these things. It makes me think, actually, I don't know whether you noticed, but Michael Gove described this trust as being, quote, on a holiday from reality. Well, this is the ANC, certainly on a holiday from reality, and a sort of permanent vacation, actually. Um, it's an astonishing situation. Incidentally, if you ever ask what is reality, my own favorite definition, Philip K. Dick, the science fiction writer, and whether you know his work, for example, he wrote a book called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? That, that was turned into the film Blade Runner. And uh, other such films from him have been Minority Report, Total Recall, I mean, all these things have been turned. But he, he had to define reality for the sake of his, he said, reality is that which, when even when you stop believing in it, it doesn't go away. And I think that's exactly the situation that we find with the ANC now. So I'm afraid the prospect we face is that these large national crises are going to impact on us in one way or another. But they will probably have a local incidence in the way that as I talked about, say, the crisis over water, that PE has got one sort of crisis over water, Durban's got another. And we will find that uh, the same will be true, with whatever. Now, you find in many small towns, Afri Forum and Solidarity have, in effect, started taking over the running of what there is left of a municipality. You find that local groups of one sort or another become more important in this situation. During the riots of 2021, if you were on the Durban Berea, the local Muslims suddenly piled in, and there they were, shouting Allahu Akbar, which was seen by the local residents as a very friendly sound, because it meant they were all ready to defend the area, and they did. And you find that all sorts of local groups come to the fore, sometimes mayors, people, officials, but quite often not. Uh, in, in 2021, it was local vigilante groups. So I think that what we will find is an increasing prominence for local groups of one sort and another. And that 
you will get an, a series of local responses to these crises. And I think, you see, if you think of the, the 2024, and as I say, there's far too much happy talk about that, but clearly one possibility is uh, that we'll get an ANC-EFF coalition. EFF are already angling for it, and it would be the easiest coalition for the ANC. It would mean joining up the old part to the ANC again, give you complete ethnic solidarity. It would be very much simpler for them than any deal with the DA or anything like that. But of course, it would be an absolutely frightful prospect. We all know what Malema's like. We know that he's a crook. We know about the VBS bank. We know about lots of other scams. And that, in effect, it would put the RET faction in power because he's in league with them. And I think you would find, and indeed this is what my suggestion would be for the DA, I think the DA ought to be campaigning from now on, saying, look, we warn the ANC, if you go for a coalition with uh, the EFF, that you will present many local regions and cities with a future they cannot stomach. Nobody wants to be under the regime of, well, you know what that means. And you're going to get people trying to break away. And I don't just talk about Western Cape. There are many people who will say, I don't want to be under that regime. We've got to have more local autonomy. And different people in different places will do it in their own way. But I'm quite sure there will be an immense resistance against such a government. And I don't just mean civil disobedience either. And I think that that ought to be put right to the fore uh, now, because uh, in effect the DA ought to be trying to make that impossible by campaigning against it. I think they would find that there's a huge number of people across society, including many within the ANC, who don't want such a thing. And I think that's the greatest danger ahead, which has to be headed off. Anyway, look, I'll stop there because I've gone on quite long enough, but uh, I will, of course, take questions and so forth. Thank you.